that we don't need to go into. What's important is Neely's come home. And Neely's come home and he's been, a, been, uh, he's been talked into without too much arm twisting to talk about his family. His family is very distinguished. And it came to Polk County before there was a Polk County. I, uh, in my research, which I'm uh, not going to go into because he has it all. But in my research, I found a 1978 reunion that was written up in the uh, standard. And it was a different spin on most reunions <coughs> because it was about seven columns long. Took up most of an entire page. And it said, from the original young pioneers, this branch, these attended, this branch, these attended, this branch, these attended, and I tell you something that isn't that much of a surprise to you, but it read like a who's who of the most distinguished families in Polk County and, and much of the surrounding geography. It's names there that they aren't all young, but it's just amazing how many people in Polk County Cedartown, the general area, are kin to the young family. A good example of that is I learn every day, but you know, where is George Monday? George is back there. I mentioned to him the other day, and he said, oh, I had it down. I wanted to be sure. I'm kin. You know? <laughs> How many times I have heard that? Without further ado, I'm very proud and honored to, uh, to introduce you, to reintroduce you to uh, a true uh, son of Polk County and a distinguished representative of a distinguished family, Mr. Neely Young. Well, I didn't kiss you. I don't like that. <laughs> or Jerry. <laughs> but a lot of you, great to see you. Excuse me. We were in high school together. We were. And I appreciate the steal of it if it doesn't work. <laughs> I'll try to make this short. I've got about 50 pages. Just be neat. All right. And, uh, and I'll first tell you a little bit about the early Youngs. I, that's what I guess is new. I was here a few years ago. And I found some early Youngs back from the 1600s. And talk a little bit about how, they're, how they came over from Liverpool, England. Then I'm going to talk about the uh, Robert Young from Glory Branch, Georgia, who built Peachtree Street, and then his son Augustine, who was the first owner of Stone Mountain, and how he came to Polk County. And then we'll conclude with a few stories. Uh, then after that, we have an Amway exhibit. I'm going to show you. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, don't, don't leave. Don't leave. <laughs> Like many people of a certain age, and I'm 65, a little older than most of you, I just wanted to know about my people and where I came from. They say that DNA in each person's body will stretch from here to the moon, and it contains all the parts and parcels of our ancestors from way back over 9,000 years ago. And it's interesting to find the history of people who are responsible for our makeup how and why our personalities and, or the way they are, and why maybe I'm shy sometimes and outgoing in others, why my hair is uh, dark and why I'm bald. So I enlisted a lady, Katie Matthews from, from Fayette County, who's a genealogist, and she agreed to help me do this research. I sent her all the family information that I'd saved, including a book written in the 1950s by my cousin, Kate Young Hand, and which documents the history of our family up to a certain point called a Georgia Pioneer and some of his descendants. Her book and some other things called Ancestry.com, if you're interested in Ancestry, that's a great website. It costs about $300, but you can really trace back your family and find documents and everything. They said the first young ancestor was Samuel Young, 1621 to 1647 who was a shipbuilder in Liverpool, England. He came to America sometime in the year 1640 to seek his fortune. Samuel lived in some of England's most turbulent times during the War of the Roses, 
and it was only 40 years before that Queen Elizabeth had destroyed the Spanish Armada. England was in the process of building the greatest navy in the world, and one that would rule the waves for over 100, 300 years. The New World at that time had the largest longleaf pine forest in the world. This forest ranged from for 150,000 square miles from Virginia, South Florida, to southwestern Texas. It was like a cathedral. You could walk through it, these huge trees. Samuel came to the New World to harvest the longleaf pine. And that, this pine was shipped back to England to use in the British fleet. It virtually built the British fleet. The young colonists, colonists all sent, but also sent back pitch and tar to coat the insides of the vessels. This process of producing tar was highly profitable and gave the nickname Tar Hills to the early residents of North Carolina. Samuel's sons also followed in these same footsteps. His son was uh, Pharaoh Young, had a brother named Moses. <laughs> I think that came from the Bible. <laughs> and he died in 1750. He moved to the Tar River on the border of Virginia and North Carolina. Their son Richard died in 1747. And they had a son named Robert. And Robert was the ancestor. He, I'll tell a little bit about him. He fought in the colonial wars, in the French and Indian wars. I haven't found out if he was with George Washington, but it'd be great if he was. Documents proving this sort of ancestry are really hard to come by. And if you're really a genealogist, this is great, but you, it really won't cut muster. You have to find the birth certificate, death certificate, marriage certificate, and prove that the ancestor in front really is, is the right person by these certificates. And it's pretty hard to find that early. But I have a great deal of historical information concerning Stephen and Diane Tucker's young well, son, Robert Young. This Robert Young was in the French and Indian, Indian War, had Stephen Young, and then his son was Robert Young. And he was born in 1760 and fought in the Revolutionary War. As a reward for his service, he received a grant of land in Flowery Branch, Hall County, Georgia, just south of Gainesville. If you know, the Falcons have their training camp there now. And they've got a pretty good football team, Jerry. I think they're in the playoffs. So. There's little known about his service during the Revolution except his company, I believe, fought in the Battle of Kettle Creek, was fought near Augusta in 1779. And they routed the British as one of the few we won. And they left Augusta short after, shortly afterwards, once they came back. It seems that Robert's genes were pretty much responsible for his descendants having been quite lovable characters and eccentrics. I'm not one of those, so I want to make you sure. <laughs> he is prominently mentioned and written about in several books. One is Franklin Garrett's book, The History of Atlanta. And I'm just going to show you the book, but he's in this book, in the first chapter, about early Atlanta and how he did some things there. During the War of 1812, the Creek Indians were in alliance with British, so to defend, a series, to defend them, a series of forts were built, starting in Flowery Branch, and came all the way. And Robert Young was commissioned to survey and then build a road along that line of forts. <coughs> Standing Peachtree, of course, later became the major city of Atlanta. This road that Robert surveyed and later built came to be known as Atlanta's famous Peachtree Boulevard, Peachtree Street. Robert and his two sons, Augustine, which was the one that came over, was a little boy. He drove the wagon, and Robert, he, he looked out for the Indians. They were on the war path, and the other people built the road. So he was a good manager of men. Didn't have to work too hard. It's in the book here that you can read this. They tell a little bit about it, and then uh, how, that, how that they built the road, and but uh, the thing that's interesting is that he tells a little bit about Robert Young also on page 11. He describes Robert Young, senior member of the trio, had no knowledge of books except the great book of nature, from which he drew liberally. liberally I quote, 
He was a man of superior judgment and had acquired from observa observation a large fund of information. His word and his integrity were never questioned by those who knew him. He always wore his hair in a queue, which he prized highly, of which he was proud of it to the day of his death. And then there's several articles that have been written about him about the hair in the queue. And I'm not sure what that meant, except if you see pictures of Thomas Jefferson, and that, that was kind of the style. They let the hair grow long, and it would curl around, and they'd cut it in a queue. He'd be run out of Polk County today. <laughs> the Joseph Habersham chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution in Atlanta placed a bronze, bronze tablet in front of the old Sears Roebuck building on Ponce de Leon Avenue, which we go by periodically, uh, in honor of Robert Young. And it says, this tablet commemorates the spot formerly Ponce de Leon Spring, where Robert Young, a Revolutionary War soldier, first traded with the Indians and built Peachtree Street. So this plaque is there to, today, and still is going to be a part of the Atlanta Beltline Project, a history project. They're going to kind of uh, restore it and do some more work on it. In a cemetery on the Morgan Valley Road between Cedartown and Rockmark are buried six generations of Youngs. Augustine Young, Robert's son, came to this site in 1832 following the Cherokee land lottery and formed the community of Young Station. It's located one and a half miles south of the cemetery. In the ensuing years, the Young's, Young Station and Young's District became a prosperous farm community with homes, a church, store, it's on railroad depot. Robert was, Augustine was the child of Robert and Celia Strickland, and he was born in Flowery Branch in 1799. He married Catherine Pounds of Augusta, of Athens, I'm sorry, Athens, Georgia, in 1820. A few years after he married Catherine, when they were both age 21, in 1822, they purchased land on Stone Mountain in the Cab County. <coughs> There's a book carved in stone that documents this, that Robert, that uh, Augustine Young was the first settler of Stone Mountain. There's several colorful legends associated with his sale, his sale of Stone Mountain later when he moved over to Polk County. When he came, one story, that he, he gave several Cherokee Indians $40 and a pony for the property. Another one that's passed down through the family, and it's in the, in the book too, when he, when he decided to move to Cedartown in Polk County, was, I'm not sure there was a cedar town then. It was a clean town. When his family decided to move, a man who heard about the sale wrote, wrote a mule 60 miles to see Augustine's, pro Augustine's property. Of course, Stone Mountain is this huge rock granite piece. And you know, it's got the, you know, it's a big park now. But when it was nothing, nothing for farmland, when he saw the rock, he decided to turn back. He told Augustine he couldn't earn a living there. It's hard bare stone. But Augustine changed his mind. He persuaded him to stay. The man paid cash for his house, and he traded Stone Mountain for his mule. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you'd have held on to it. <laughs> In Franklin Garrett's book, he tells this story about Augustine Young. In 1833, I'm quoting, he moved to Paulding County, created the year before, and took up his residence in that part of the, part of the, part of the county later set aside for Polk County five miles from Cedartown, so I guess it was, Cedartown was here. The settlement that grew up around his residence is still called Young Station. He spent his, the remainder of his life as a substantial father, farmer, and at the age attaining a substantial weight of 365 pounds. He and his wife, Catherine Pounds, died the same day, February the 2nd, 1868, and both are buried in the same grave at the cemetery at Young Station. Now, I've got some pictures. Y'all want to see some stuff I heard, so let's pass some pictures over. We'll just, just before we get there. Here's, here's Augustine and Catherine Celia Strickland here. And this is him. All right, I'll get to that. I'll, let's, let's put him in a second. I also brought a picture of the Cedartown Mighty Mites from 1955. 
Yeah. You can pass those. You want to pass them around? Let's pass them around. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Let's pass those. Yeah, yeah. Well, don't you? Okay. Start. Oh, yeah, just pass these around. You All right. Cousin Roy Holmes Hand of Abington, uh, Pennsylvania, who comes down here to our farm a good bit, has a lot of knowledge about our, uh, about the Youngs, and he reports that... You're with that big one. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> He reports that when Gustin left Stone Mountain and moved, moved, they had six children. And of course, acquired an extensive plantation and kept large herds of, of uh, horses, mules, hogs, and sheep. And they produced seven children. Four of his sons served in the Confederate Army. My son, my, my son, my father James Youngs tells this story about Augustine. In 1864, after the Battle of Atlanta, the Yankee Army was chasing Confederate General John Bell Hood's retreating Confederate troops, and they passed through Young Station. They came up and burned Cedartown later. Augustine was an elderly, elderly man who was concerned for his safety. He hid in a ditch. He was still a substantial person. When the blue coats came through the settlement, one officer start, spotted a large belly protruding over the ditch <laughs> and went to investigate. There he found my great-great-grandfather. Yeah. But because of his age, he was left alone, and Augustus wounded, Augustine's wounded pride was all that was inflicted. <laughs> my Aunt Ida tells this story. When the Yankees came through Young Station, Augustine hid his horses and cattle in the piney woods. His favorite horse was a beautiful white stallion called Buck. Buck and the rest of the horses and cattle were taken by the northern troops to be used. The horses were used as replacements for the cavalry. After Hood was chased out of Georgia into Tennessee, Buck was probably used in General William T. Sherman's march to the sea, unfortunately. A year later, Augustine was sitting in his kitchen at the home at Young's place and he looked up to see Buck's big white head sticking through the kitchen window. Ma, he said, old Buck has come back. Lord knows how many people and places he's seen. And there was great rejoicing that he had returned. This is a little sad. He and his wife died on the same day, she in the morning. Augustine in the afternoon of February 2nd, 1868. Both died at the age of 69 years. A great friend, and I haven't been able to find who wrote this, who was a lawyer and farmer sat and comforted him the day he passed away. The story states in part, and I told you I was going to read some of this, it lists Augustine's good friends in these Polk County pioneers as John Carley, Winston Watley, John Pollard, and R.L. Pollard. And I'm sure Mr. Peak, see, he was here, wasn't he, Jewel? <coughs> Before he passed away, the story reads, he was constantly talking about his affairs. And remember, this is 18, right after the Civil War. And you remember who was down here was the carpetbaggers. He was requesting assistance from this attorney to help his son James in winding up his estate and not let the lawyers get a hold of it. Some things never change. <laughs> I have Mike McGray in here, do I'm sorry, sorry, cousin, I didn't mean that. <laughs> there were few men who did not know Augustus Young, he called him Augustus. To know him was to respect him, his love and devotion to principle were never, never questioned. He was a large, fleshy man, about six feet, his common weight was about 225 pounds. He'd lost a little bit. He never had the advantage of a polished education, but through life I would claim for him the wisdom of Henry Clay. In various positions he held in life, he developed a true element of moral grace, greatness. His wife, Catherine Pounds, was a corpse at the same time, and only about 14 hours between their deaths was perhaps one of the noblest specimens of her sex. She was truly a kind and devoted wife and possessed all the elements of a lady. My father said that, uh, that he died of a broken heart. She died early. James Young. Not my James Young, but let me find him. He's here somewhere. In that hymn in the front? No, that's, uh, yes, okay. James Young was the child of Augustine and Catherine Pounds. He's here in his Confederate uniform. Okay. He was born in Stone Mountain on December 2nd, 1832. He died in Cedartown in 1918. He married Emmeline 
Edna Ammons of Ammons Springs. Is this too loud? No. Okay. According to Jonathan Holmes Hands, his great, great, great grandson, James was quite young when his parents moved to Paulding. In Polk County, the Cherokee Indians were still in the county. He remembers seeing the government wagons pass by his home with Indians and their little children going on the Trail of Tears. My Aunt Ida remembered the same story, but little James looking out the window and seeing a group of Indians crying. During the war between the states, James enlisted in 1862 and served eight months in the 1st Georgia Cavalry under Colonel James Morrison. He was later commissioned as a lieutenant in Yesser's Legion and served at the, to the end of the war. After the war, he developed a 4,000-acre farm and ran a general merchandise store in Young's. The children of James and Emmeline Ammons are some of the senior town's most important families, according to my wonderful cousin, Augusta Birch. <laughs> some of you know Augusta. She was a wonderful character. My, my sweet wife came over here when we were getting married and, to meet the family, and uh, her mother, my mother-in-law, was a pretty, pretty tough lady. <laughs> And, and my fine lady, and uh, Augusta sat next to her and said, do you know that you're marrying into the finest family in Georgia? I don't know if mom still thinks about that. <laughs> Darling, she said. I'm going to list the children and, name, and some of the names of these families, and you're, you're right, you're going to know these names are from a lot of us, you know. Uh, Augusta Young married Annie Neely. James Sterling Young, nicknamed Uncle Brother, I always knew him as Uncle Brother, married Fanny Casey, the Casey family here in, in, uh, in uh, uh, Polk County's big. Ida Agnes Young married James Hazel. Kate Adeline Young married Daniel Hightower, Hightower Falls. Molly Young married Frank Irvin, that's yours, isn't it? Lucy Minerva Young married John Henderson and later John Hawkins. Cousin, I'm not sure which one is your, your uh, great grandfather, but uh, and these folks are mostly all buried out in the cemetery at Young's. <coughs> Augusta and Eugene Young married Annie White Neely of Rome, Georgia. That's that's my grandmother, and Annie was the daughter of Professor Benjamin Neely, who was the first superintendent of schools of the Rome City Schools. This is in 1897. And just think about it, these early pioneers, they didn't really have schools and barely had churches. They had circuit riders. And so it wasn't until after the Civil War that the school system kind of developed all over the country, especially in Polk County. So he came to Rome and was their first superintendent of school, and that's who I'm named after. Their children were, were of Annie and Augustine. Augustine there are six children named Emmeline, Eve, Mary, Annie, Ida, and Buddy, Eugene. Now, this is a, a, this is a new, the other, Augustine Eugene and his wife, Annie, on the bottom here. A right attractive couple, I'd say. Didn't rub off on me, but. <laughs> Augustine was a successful banker, merchant, and farmer, and he expanded the Young's farm to over 4,000 acres. He established the Commercial Bank of Cedartown and was served as his first president. And my friend Lloyd Gray worked there, you know, and so he's got, there's some history there. He moved into young, from Young Stations in, into Cedartown about 1908, and there he built a fine new home close to downtown on College Street. About a year after the family moved to Cedartown, Augustine was nicknamed Gus, he got into a friendly disagreement with a Judge Haynes, and I'm not sure that's the correct name, who had just built a big fine home on the outskirts of town on Walden Avenue. Gus played penny poker every Wednesday night with the judge and several other friends. And a friendly argument centered on which house was the finest. Gus's home on College Street was better than his, the judge said. <laughs> Gus believed the judge's home on Walden Avenue outside of town was best. This argument went on for several weeks. Cedar Town being a small town, it was not long after the whole community weighed in. Finally, Gus to settle just decided to settle the disagreement once for all. He challenged the judge to a notion. If you think my house is better than yours, I'll just trade houses with you. <laughs> Everyone was shocked. The judge agreed. 
And within, within a week, both Gus and the judge drew up deeds and swapped houses. <laughs> Gus went home and told his, his wife, Annie, Honey, I just traded houses. My father remembers it was the only time I ever saw Mama cry, he said. This story's been told over and over down through the years. And old timers like Jewel and I still, still remember it. My Aunt Mary told me that it probably wasn't a bad decision by Gus. Papa was his nickname. Papa worried about his young twins, Ida and Annie. Being five years of age, they were just old enough to get into trouble. The automobile was new to Cedartown, and Papa's new house was located too close to town. The twins roamed all over Main Street, darting around horses and Model T Fords. What broke the camel's back was when Mr. Vance of Vance Grocery Store next door to the bank called Papa and reported that the twins were in the garbage in the back of the store eating old watermelons. <laughs> well, that did it. He said that just, he decided to trade houses right then. And I've got a picture of the twins. What amazed me, I have to interject this, is I said, but Neely, I thought the judge's house was out of town, like out in the country. And he said, well, it was. Walnut Street was out of town. And I was like, oh, look at that. that. And then here, here they are as younger women. Wow, they are. Anybody know, remember my Aunt Mary? She was, both these homes are still standing. Just right down here is Lester Lights, the funeral home. That was the original home. And then the Walnut Street home was the front was the home of Gus Murphy, Murphy son, son of Emmeline Young Murphy. And Jewel, you sold that house. To, who'd you sell that house to? You remember? Uh, some carpet baggage. <laughs> <laughs> the automobile was new to Cedartown in the early 1900s, and Papa was one of the first people in town to own a Model T Ford. He had an unusual way of driving the car in that he didn't know how to use the brakes. Townspeople got used to seeing him drive down the street. They would dive out of the way and stay clear when he came down the road. <laughs> My father asked him one day why he didn't use the brakes. He replied, that's what a horn's for. <laughs> <laughs> Papa also had very unusual eating habits. When all six children and, and, and Mama and Papa arrived at the table, dessert was served first. Then the prayer of thanks would follow the rest of the meal. One day, Papa was about to say grace, and the telephone rang. He bowed his head and said, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Gus was one of the founding members of the Polk County Farmers Club. It was made up of Polk County's leading citizens, including the heads of Cobb, Graves, Peaks, and Casey families. The club is still in existence today, I believe. They would meet for lunch each month at one of the members' houses, and there was a big feed served each meeting, with two or three meats, five or six vegetables, and of course, a big dessert. All of the ingredients were raised on each member's farm. That was the, the plan. At one of the meetings held in the young home, the kitchen caught on fire just as dessert was being served. Everyone ran out into the front yard. Mama Young would have, not have her fine meal interrupted and insisted the members finish dessert. She set up a makeshift, ta makeshift table out in the front yard, and everyone finished the meal while the fire trucks came and put out the blaze. <laughs> Gust was known as a teetower, meaning he avoided strong spirits. My father used to watch him disappear into the pantry for 10, ten so, or so minutes each morning, every morning, just as he left to go to the bank. One day, little James went, in the, the, and went into the pantry after Papa left to go to the office, and discovered on the counter in the back a mason's jar full of clear liquid <laughs> with an empty glass sitting next to the jar. Being curious, like most children, he filled the glass up and took a big drink. Much to his shock and surprise, he found out that the jar was full of <laughs> corn whiskey. <clears throat> you just need a little bit of a kick to get him started in the morning. We all need that. Gus's brother, Sterling Young, was also a great character. I remember many stories about Uncle Brother. He always carried a fiddle with him, and he would show up unannounced for a visit on a neighbor's front porch. All of the family on the, in the house, including children and adults, would pile out of the porch while he would play, play a tune on his fiddle and perform a jig. My father was the child of a Gus and Eugene Young. He was born in Cedartown, June 30, 1902. 
My mother, Dorothy Little Griffin, was the daughter of Dr. Archibald Griffin of Valdosta. She was born in Valdosta in 1908. My father died up in Dalton. We were still living up there and, uh, at 1985 peacefully. And mother died in 19, uh, 1990. They were married in, at Valdosta October the 6th, 1934. My father continued the family tradition of being a merchant farmer. He ran Young Hardware Company on Main Street in Cedartown for 40 years. He helped establish the Cedartown Chamber of Commerce and was, was his second president, its second president. My mo mother was co-founder of the Junior League, and they were both very active at, at St. James Episcopal Church here in Cedartown. Mother and Daddy met at a wedding at one of their best friend's homes in Osceola, Georgia. Mother said she first noticed Daddy when he fell out of a chair at the rehearsal dinner. <laughs> <laughs> he was a handsome man, she said. <laughs> when he retired, he took up golf at the Cherokee Club. His regular threesome included his best friends Ed Graves and Phil Brewster. They had a lot of fun cussing and fussing around the course. Sometimes they would draw a crowd that would follow them around just to see what would happen. My father James would approach the tee and say, Damn it, I'm going to miss it. Damn it, I'm going to miss it. Then he'd take a big swing and say, Damn it, I missed it. <laughs> my sweet wife uh, walked in on my father in the shower when he was uh, about 80 years old. <laughs> And he turned around, turned his back to her and looked over and says, Well, you've just seen a fine figure of a man. <laughs> <laughs> my father, when he, when he was going to marry uh, mother, uh, he came to my team, Augustine, and said, uh, Daddy, I've got something really serious to tell you. Oh, my gosh, he said, come outside. So he went outside. He said, well, I'm going to get married. He said, my God, I thought you were born and burned down. <laughs> I was trying to think of one other one that was, uh, but finally, finally, uh, this is kind of acute, even though they passed away, but my father died on December 24th, and mother commented, that's just like James to die on Christmas Eve and ruin everybody's Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> All the young descendants were colorful, a little bit eccentric. Yet they were very accomplished people. They were honest, hardworking folks who contributed much energy to helping build Polk County and what it is today. Except my, my sister and I, we broke the mold. Uh, we're Dorothy's and James, young children. We were raised in Cedartown. Yet we're kind of dull people, not characters at all. Uh, you all in this room know us. We never have, never have been eccentric. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Comments or questions? Any memories? I have a picture that I found recently of my mother pregnant with me at about nine months in 1945, and your Aunt Mary pregnant with the twins. How about that? They were born around the same time I was, and they're standing belly to belly. Oh, that's right. I, 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 I love to that. Really <laughs> the twins have been a kind of a uh, thing that happens in our generations. I've got a, uh, I've got a uh, something I was going to present to Tom. This is a history of the young family. It's, it's uh, not. A, I'm going to write this. I'm writing this as an oral history, and I'll, I'll attach it to you. But to it, but this is goes back to uh, to that that first young that was. Uh, I'm just mentioning when we were in Nash County, North Carolina, in 1748. Uh, his birth certificate, death certificate, marriage certificate, all the, all the generations, all the way up through present generation, if somebody want to do some history, that's, that's a great. thing that they really have to have. Well, thank you so much, Neely. We appreciate so much your presentation, and uh, we want you to stay around with us and meet some of the more of your friends and meet some of these... Uh, Good refreshing. All right, great. Okay. One, thanks, Tom. Now, where is Ann White? While I'm standing right here, get her around this corner. She's in the kitchen. Yeah, but I wasn't born yesterday. 
Now when I get something like this, I know where to put it. <laughs> Incidentally, uh, he used the term uh, uncle brother. I use the term aunt sister this very day. Now who, uh, now there are two or three of you and who can tell me who I would call aunt sister. Who is aunt sister? She's Leela Mullen, you remember? She was a uh, Wyatt, of course, and she was called Aunt Sister. And it's interesting that Neely mentioned it, because this very day in the drugstore, uh, and I'm one of the few that have guts enough to call her Aunt Sister, but, uh, and she loves it, by the way. And she's just, uh, she, she is a mirror image of an Aunt Sister. She was driving this huge Suburban, and I see this little little uh, blonde lady here and I said that's a lot of car for you and she said oh no says I've been driving cars since I was 10 I drive in <laughs> off she went <laughs> one other thing I kneel and you might can help me here if my recollection is but we'll suspend one minute and I we just got something very nice on the young family well, that's one as president I received it from Neely. I want to present it to put it in your hands where I'll know it'll be properly recorded and everything. <laughs> Take it on. Y'all are my witnesses. Y'all are my witnesses. If it disappears. <laughs> Here Jewel might have to help me a little bit. My recollection too <clears throat> is of the, I believe, eight founding fathers of Cherokee Country Club. One still is alive and that is Gus Henderson. We recently honored, very justifiably, all of the founding fathers, and uh, if you have occasion to, to uh, go return to the club, we have their portraits right there at the entrance, a lovely thing. But uh, in reading, uh, my recollection in reading that uh, 1978 reunion, there was an, a, a Gus Henderson and so on, and is it not so that Gus Henderson is is a cousin too? Yes. Uh -huh. yes. And I think Gus Henderson's name is is a, this is a question, not a statement. Is his is his? I know it's either Augustus or Augustine. Who knows? Do you either one of y'all know? It's, Augustus. Uh -huh. Augustus. I mean, he's called Gus, but I would, I didn't know what he was called. That's probably Augustus. Without the e I think it is. Yeah. I think it probably is. Anyway, he's a fine gentleman. He is one of the last of the uh, the last of the founding fathers. Thank you very much for uh, sharing your family with us. Thank you also for the documentation. Uh, we, we love to get that sort of stuff. And we love to touch and feel stuff too. Thank you so much. Now, uh, we do have, uh, have uh, <coughs> uh, refreshments.